This is Geek Gab with your hosts, John, Brian, and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. Geek Gab for Saturday, May 13th, 2017. And uh, we want to welcome everybody to our Saturday show, as is our usual want. We've gone out and seen some stuff and done some stuff and have some things to talk about. Thankfully, you might understand, you must understand as members of our audience that we have recently split the podcast into not one, but not two, but three full separate podcasts. And so we, your hosts, have to work even harder to come up with great content to share with you, our audience. Our first uh, podcast is, of course, Geek Gab or Geek Gab Prime, which is what you are currently listening to at this very moment. Our second podcast is Geek Gab Game Night, hosted by John himself, talking about RPGs and uh, being a game master and all of that fun, fun stuff. And our third podcast is, of course, Geek Gab on the Books, hosted by Dragon Award-winning author Brian Neymar, talking about writing and publishing, how to get artists for your books, how to publicize your novels, and all of the fun stuff that uh, you as aspiring writers might want to tune in for. So there are three, three full podcasts that we produce uh, two of them are once a week. One of them is every other week. So we have a, a ton of great stuff. If there is some interest of yours, I can guarantee you it will be met somewhere. So before we go any further with the topic of today's show, let me turn the time over to my fellow hosts. John, how was your week? Well, overall, it was a stinker, but I've got a couple of great highlights uh, the gaming show, we did our second gaming show, like you mentioned, on Thursday. Had a really great time talking with Rick Stump and you guys. And uh, and today, uh, we'll be doing grilling and gaming, since it is finally spring out here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a good, get, good day. How about you, Brian? It's been a week. So I, have, I have no conception of time anymore, so you guys are going to have to remind me. Yeah, it's just been... Been plugging away editing um, both my upcoming project with Castalia House and also wanted to give a shout out to my buddy Justin Stoic Writer in the chat. I'm hard at work on his second novel right now, which I'm editing. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of plates in the air. Made ourselves real busy, didn't we? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Um, you have, uh, for On the Books next week, you have a special guest coming on. Who is that? That special guest is a friend of the show, Yakov Merkin, who's been on with us before. And he's coming on to talk about his new book, which uh, should be dropping any day now. I believe it's called uh, A Greater Duty. And I could be totally sticking my foot in my mouth because I don't have it in front of me. But uh, we'll, we'll correct that on Wednesday. Uh, we're also can be discussing how to write non-human characters. Um, by the way, folks, if you want to keep track of all these goings on, if you want to keep track of all the different podcasts we have going on, YouTube has decided to change how subscribing works. If you're already a subscriber, then what you need to do is go down where it says subscribe, and right next to it is a little bell icon. That is the super double secret subscription button. Only by clicking on the little bell-shaped icon can you actually get uh, can you actually get updates about when the show is going live, about what we, your hosts, are doing. If uh, otherwise, you won't hear anything because YouTube assumes that unless you super double secret subscribe, that you don't actually care about what you have subscribed to, that you don't actually want to know when we've got a show scheduled, uh, when we uh, when Geek Gab Prime or one of our Geek Gab guidance are going off. So, uh, for those of you who do want to get those announcements, and I'm uh, please super double secret subscribe, and you'll get them an email, and you'll know when we uh, start a show, you'll know when we've got shows scheduled, and you'll be able to keep up and listen to the podcasts on here, the Geek Gab channel now, I guess. We, we're technically a podcasting channel now, since we've got three podcasts going. Is that right? 
Yeah, we're a podcasting network. Network. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the term. We're a podcasting network now. It's not just the Geek Gab podcast. We're now the podcasting network. So if you're interested in, in any one of the three shows that we at Geek Gab are producing, for you, our audience, please, super double secret, subscribe. Now, I uh, I went out and watched a movie last night. That's what I did. Which oh, movie I was, was that? I was wondering what we were going to talk about if it wasn't gaming or books. <laughs> I went and watched King Arthur Crime Kingpin. Now, now that's the one done by Guy Ritchie, right? That is, in point of fact, the one done by Guy Ritchie. Of, uh, you know, Guy Ritchie's done a ton of movies. Guy Ritchie's done a ton of great movie. He is movies. He is absolutely an amazing director. And uh, you may remember, you know, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Um, it is a British crime film about a bunch of low-down scum and the problems they get up to on London's street. Uh, he also did, uh, let's see, some of his more famous ones. The recent the Sherlock Holmes, right? Yeah, the both Sherlock Holmes movies uh, that recently came out. Also, The Man from Uncle, which was pretty much <laughs> overlooked. I actually saw that one. It was not great. The Man from Uncle, yeah, I saw The Man from Uncle too. It was, it was not great. My but, favorite uh, Guy Ritchie, really quick. My favorite Guy Ritchie film is actually the commercial he did for BMW, starring Clive oh. Owen, like ten years ago or more. The reason why I bring up Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, which again is about a bunch of hard case criminals on the streets of London, is because for a good three-fourths or half of its running length, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, his new movie that debuted on Thursday, I think, so two days ago here in America, is in point of fact a movie about hard-bitten criminal types on the streets of London. Only they call it Londonium, of course, and the crime kingpin, the head chief, criminal hard case in the movie is king arthur or will be king arthur eventually at this point he's just arthur so i want you lot to understand this before i go any further with the review this movie is not actually a king arthur movie if you go to watch this movie with the expectation that it will, in any way, shape, or form, resemble the tales of King Arthur, with which you may be familiar, you are going to be gravely disappointed. This movie is not about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. In fact, the analogy I would use is if you have seen the very, very first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, which is a movie made, uh, ostensibly made, about a ride at Disneyland, the Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, I hate to tell you this, folks. I hate to, to break your hearts. You have been lied to. Pirates of the Caribbean was, in point of fact, a completely different supernatural pirate movie. That the person who wrote it, the person who penned the script could not get it produced. Nobody would make it. Nobody would give money to make this pirate movie. Well, they got hooked up with Disney, and Disney says, well, we want to make a movie. He gave up on the script. Had it sitting by, gave up on the script. Disney says, we want to make a movie based on Pirates of the Caribbean. So the guy reached behind him to his desk drawer where this completely unsaleable script had been sitting, pulled it out, changed a few names, added a song, bit of the song here and there, and sold it to Disney as Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Not based on the ride. 
not actually based on the ride, a completely different script with a couple of things added to make it uh, resemble certain parts of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. So, by way of analogy, if you think of this King Arthur film as a script, as a fantasy movie script that has nothing to do with King Arthur at all, but which they later went back and changed some names so that it would resemble King Arthur. So that it would resemble King Arthur. Then you will understand the movie and you won't be setting yourself up for disappointment. Um, actually, I want to go back and I want to correct something I just said earlier. Last night I had to do a blog, a blog post for today. So, of course, I did a blog post talking about this show that was coming on. We're going to talk about King Arthur, but I also covered, um, I also watched and posted about the Cinema Sins uh, uh, takedown of 2004 King Arthur by Antoine Fuqua, starring Kira Knightley and, uh, and some other people. Uh, Clive Owen, oddly enough, to bring it back to Brian's comment. But uh, I have to correct myself uh, because I got... <laughs> I've had too much King Arthur in the last 24 hours. King Arthur, crime kingpin, is not actually himself in London. His crew is running around Camelot. They are scumbag thieves on the streets of Camelot. So I'm, I just needed to correct that. I had the two mixed up in the back of my mind. My apologies. So I want to tell you, if, if this movie isn't a King Arthur legend, what is this movie about? Well, this movie steals from the story of Moses, it steals from Hamlet, it steals from Robin Hood, and it steals bits from gladiator movies, kung fu movies, and even the Lord of the Rings, shock of all shocks. The very first scene in the movie has oliphants in it, the giant elephants that were also in the, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings movies. So, despite that, this movie is not derivative of any of those. It steals bits and pieces of them, but Guy Ritchie has taken them into himself and reworked them completely and produced something which is singularly and solely a Guy Ritchie movie. I think, although I cannot be sure, that he must have been playing The Witcher 3 at some point because the movie, the feel of the movie, the events in, in the movie, are kind of consonant with the feel of the characters and situations in The Witcher 3. There are, you know, lots of monsters in the countryside. There is political intrigue. There are, you know, there's a guerrilla movement and so on and so forth. You should also know that in this day and time of the George R. R. Martin's pretty big epic fantasy series, which got made into the HBO Game of Thrones TV series. The Game of Thrones, which has had a massive impact on fantasy movies and novels. The Game of Thrones TV series had a massive impact, more even than the books. You should know that this movie is not a Game of Thrones clone. And it is not a Lord of the Rings clone. So you don't have to worry about either of those things when you go see the movie. It's not going to be like you're sitting through an episode of, of Game of Thrones or a season of Game of Thrones. And it's not like someone is trying to make ex remake Lord of the Rings movies in order to get all that money. So it is its own thing. And it manages to avoid a lot of the cliches. Or at least when tropes are in it that have been used before, they are used in interesting and thoughtful ways. So, I have a verdict on this film. I have a personal verdict and I have a professional verdict. And I'm going to have to split this, these, those two. The first thing I would like to say is I don't think this movie is going to be very successful. I don't think it's going to make a lot of money. Um... I just get the feeling that it's going to be really too odd for most of the audience to grasp. I the I went to a Friday night showing, 6 o'clock in the evening, and the theater had about five people in it. Um, my, my assessment of its popular appeal 
is that people just aren't interested in this specific movie. For whatever reason, my sense of the audience is that most people are just not interested in this movie. Now, I'm not saying the movie is bad. I'm not saying the movie is awful. I'm not saying you shouldn't go see it. I'm just saying that I don't think it's going to be very enjoyable. Excuse me, very popular, very successful. Now, on a personal level, me personally, I enjoyed the movie. There were a couple of really, really bad eye-rolling moments in it. Three, I think, maybe four. But the rest of the movie was quite enjoyable. However, just to give an example, I think Brian would probably hate the movie based on what he's expressed in the past. And I'm guessing that John probably wouldn't like it all that much. And I'm going to substantiate those opinions uh, as I read a little bit more through my notes here. Yeah, I sat down in this movie theater watching it on the screen, actually in 3D, so I had, you know, polarized glasses on so everything was even darker, writing down notes on uh, notebook paper in the dark. I, I am fortunate, blessed, that I was able to read my own handwriting and uh, type these up. Did, did you use 3D notebook paper? Uh, all notebook paper is 3D because it has to exist in this material universe. That was supposed to be, man, you hit my curveball. That was good. <laughs> um, let's see. Scrolling through, scrolling through, scrolling through. Okay, so here's some example. Here's an example of uh, some of the things they changed. The very beginning of the film has Uther Pendragon, who is Arthur's father, if you don't know anything about the uh, Arthur, King Arthur legends. He's fighting a war against a vast and powerful magician, a mage who is leading a mage army on an assault against Camelot. The leader, the general, the commander, the king of this invading magical army is Mordred. Mordred is not King Arthur's bastard son. Mordred is instead um, an immensely powerful magician who Uther fights in single combat and kills uh, when Arthur himself is like six years old. So, once again... You've got to be prepared for a movie that does not pay attention to historical accuracy. There is literally a Chinaman whose name is Kung Fu George in the movie, who teaches Arthur how to fight, who runs a fighting school in Camelot. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, um, because you get, they just get a bunch of monks, right, to fight the major army. They're all right after that. So, yeah. What do you want to do after lunch? I don't know. Cause, Cause you, it's, it's like the, it's like the Batman Begins movie. You know what's what's better than you know whatever contemporary uh, martial arts of the day is? No, just send him off to be a ninja. How do you teach King Arthur to fight? Just leave him with the monks. He'll learn kung fu. It's awesome. Um, and the kung fu school is actually more of a gladiator school. It's almost like the school that you see at the beginning of Three Hundred. Um. The, what do they call it? Adogi. The Adogi you see at the beginning of 300. So you, you've got to understand that not only is there no fidelity to the Arthurian legends, there's no fidelity to history. So if you can push those two things aside and say, this is a fantasy movie set in a fantasy world, it has nothing to do with the real world. For example, in The Gunslinger, um, the very first book in the Dark Tower series, you find out that there was, in point of fact, a King Arthur in the Gunslinger's world, even though Midworld is not Earth and never was. Think of it that way. This is a King Arthur and a Camelot and things like that that's on a completely separate world. It is not actually Earth. They just share some names. Then you're going to be prepared to go in and see the movie. If you're expecting hysteriosity, it will not be here. If you're expecting fidelity to the legends, it will not be found in this film. If you can't set those aside, you will hate the movie. If you can't set those aside, you've got a chance of enjoying it. Um, so let's go into some details here. Some details. Let me, uh, one of the things this movie had that was great, that was notably lacking in the Captain America movie. Now, do you guys remember the first Captain America movie, uh, John and Brian? Wait, what? 
Captain America, the first Avenger, the first Captain America movie, where he's a skinny kid from Brooklyn who gets yeah. a... You remember the movie, right? Yes. Okay. The big weakness in the middle third of that movie was that they had a bunch of fight scenes against Hydra, but there wasn't any framework to it. There wasn't any strategizing. You didn't know what the action sequences were or how they impacted the war as a whole or what they mean. They were just violence. And you guys had a tweet conversation about this earlier, so you know of what I'm speaking. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Brian, you can recap that if you'd like. I, I like your definitions. Thanks, absolutely. So this actually came out of uh, me working on my editing projects. So, okay. We have three elements, three story elements here, okay? Three things that can be in a book that are somewhat related, but that people often conflate or confuse for each other. So there is violence, action, and conflict. These are not the same thing. What differentiates them are character and stakes. Okay, so as I said to Dornall earlier, so violence is a bomb going off in an empty building. All right, you don't even need to have any character involved. And again, I'm not saying including this in a book is bad if you know or use it, but you just don't want to substitute one of these things for the other. That, that's the point. Okay, so action could be a couple of characters just getting drunk and having a fist fight really over nothing, right? And that is more what the Captain America fight montage felt like in the first Avenger. But then conflict is action plus character plus stakes. So having a physical altercation of some kind, like I use the, the example, you know, there's a rookie race car driver who we know and we get to know his struggle and he is in just this fraught, grueling race against a bitter rival, and only one of them can win the first prize purse that our hero needs to pay for his wife's operation or something. That's conflict. See you know what I'm saying? So the Captain America fight montage was violence. It was just scenes of violence going on, or excuse me, it was just action. It was scenes of action going on. There was no conflict because you didn't know the stakes. Well, in this movie, they're out here to fight against Vortigern. Vortigern is Arthur Pendragon's brother, who is Arthur's father, who murders Arthur's father and mother and takes over the kingdom. So that's where the Hamlet bit comes in. So... Arthur now has been awoken to his destiny. He accepts that he's going to have to fight Vortigern. We'll get back to the reelected hero thing for, in just a second. And so they have this conference to plan strategy. How are they going to get Vortigern? Well, they say, okay, well, what, what does Vortigern love more than anything else? And some people give some bad answers. And finally, they point out to this huge mage tower Vortigern is building because by building this tower, he becomes indeed a magician. He becomes a mage. He becomes immensely powerful. The taller the tower is, the more magical power Vortigern himself will have. So they specifically identify elements that go into the construction of this tower and plan missions very, very quickly. By the way, this happens all very, very quickly. The movie moves very, very fast. It is not a long, slow, boring movie. It is an action movie. If you've seen Guy Ritchie movies, if like the Sherlock Holmes, the last two Sherlock Holmes, you know of which I speak. They plan specific missions to go out and hamper the building, the construction of this tower. Well, what's the first thing they decide to uh, hurt? Well, he has to ship in all this stone from quarries down the river. So they go out and they hit the boats. So he can't get stone to build the tower higher. Well, he's building this tower with a vast slave labor force. So they go out and they set a bunch of his slaves free. It isn't just action. It is actual conflict because they have goals. They have a grand strategy in mind. And you, the audience, know what they're trying to do. And they know, and you know why. 
and it gives this sequence, which isn't very long. I, in fact, I would say it's it probably not a lot longer than the similar sequence in Captain America, but it is immensely more effective because you as the audience understand what they're doing and why and how it will hurt the king. And that is a very good um, point in the movie's favor is they actually bothered to think things like that out. Um, the person who plays King Arthur, by the way, does a great job. You cannot help but like him. He has this roguish charm. He is a good guy. He's a fun guy. You can't help but like him. So I, let me... I wanna... I, can I jump in there because I wanted to ask about that that guy. Okay. I'm glad I'm glad you said that because this is the guy who was in Sons of Anarchy, right? Yes. Uh, we're talking. His name is Charlie Hunnam. I've never and seen the show, but yes, he's in it. So, so this is one of the reasons why I was hesitant to want to see this movie because uh, I've seen a few, you know, the first season of Sons of Anarchy, and he was also the lead guy in Pacific Rim. And and I didn't yes. like him. I didn't like him much at all. In fact, um, my wife describes him as a black hole of charisma. <laughs> One of those guys with a pretty face that you cast in the lead role of a movie, and he does nothing for the role. So I'm really surprised to hear you say that he was enjoyable and he did a good job. Why did you say that? No, no. I said that you couldn't help but liking the character. Because the character himself is filled with this roguish charm. He's not a malicious person. He's not a power-hungry person. This is, by the way, why this is not a Game of Thrones clone. Because there is absolutely evil, and there's absolutely good, and Vortigern is actually evil. They don't make any excuses for it. And he does two things in the movie specifically, which are absolutely beyond the moral event horizon. And Arthur is, despite his criminal upbringing, uh, uh, despite his upbringing as a, uh, you know, urchin on the streets of Camelot, um, he was, this is where Moses comes in by the way. He was put in a boat uh, and floated away in order to get away from Vortigern so he wouldn't get killed as a child while his parents were being slaughtered. And he's picked out of the river by a bunch of prostitutes and is raised in a brothel. So he's raised to be a thief. He's raised to be... Uh, really, really angry at what happens to these prostitutes, so he learns and fights in this dojo and becomes a muscular man and eventually becomes the guy who's running the, the brothel, but also their protector. And then he forms a you know, criminal gang in Camelot. Um, people who pass through his territory have to pay him money. When a bunch of Vikings um, beat up one of the prostitutes, he goes out there, faces down these 50 Vikings, literally 50 Vikings, uh, tricks them, pulls a blade on the king, uh, on the, sorry, the leader of the Vikings, cuts off his long braided beard and walks out of there with a year's worth of wages for the prostitute and then gives it to her. So he was lived in poverty. He's been slowly, slowly, slowly doing everything he can, honest and dishonest, to earn money to be secure instead of being absolutely poor. So the character of Arthur and the way he's played has a roguish charm that makes you like the character because he's basically an all right guy. He's not a good guy, but he's basically an all right guy. Um, I don't know that you're going to say that he did a tremendous job in the performance. I don't know that, that uh, your wife will like him anymore, that Mrs. Dornall will like the actor anymore, but you can't help but like the king, the character. At least I couldn't. That sounds good. I had another question about the king, the character. In uh, in Guy Ritchie's famous gangster movies, that hard case uh, gang lord is the antagonist, and very effective antagonists. Bricktop in Snatch, and uh, what's his name? Uh, in yeah. uh, and. And the group of criminals are kind of decent. They're, you know, they're likable guys. They're not good people, but they're likable characters. And that the boss they're facing, that big mob boss they're facing, is completely evil, completely irredeemable, and a real, real tough guy. So uh, does this movie sort of flip that around? I mean, it sounds like the, the wizard is, no. is the evil bad guy, but you also made it sound like King Arthur is also a hard case gang lord. Well, Arthur is a criminal, 
and he runs his little gang. But it's just like one of the gangs. He's, in fact, it's 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 a lot like the gang from Lock, Stock, and Smoking Barrels. They're just criminals. That's what they do. Like when you play Shadowrun, you're playing criminals. The hard case evil guy is the king, the false king, Vortiger, who has stolen the throne and crown from his brother and is trying to hunt down and kill Arthur. So, yes, it's, it's fully Guy Ritchie because there is a big bad hard case who runs a bunch of stuff and who's chasing down the heroes and trying to kill them. Only the protagonists are, you know, Arthur and, and a couple of other guys. So... I love it. In fact, it, it, maybe it would have even been better if he had just recast the guys from a lock, stock, and two smoking <laughs> barrels as the knights of their own table. They're a little too old now. That's, uh, yeah, that's... I guess they are. <laughs> um, Jason, Jason Nathan could do the uh, action scene still. So, now let me start listing things why Brian hates this movie. Um, there is no Merlin in the movie. Instead of a Merlin, they send a hot goth chick who is a mage i don't remember no in fact she doesn't I, i'm just checking imdb right now i couldn't even remember if they had given her a name in the entire movie and according to imdb she is just the mage she has no name whatsoever and they don't mention one they just call her the mage okay no merlin uh, the one time Merlin appears on screen, he's in a uh, you know a monk's cassock. You don't even see his face. Instead, this the mage, this hot twenty-something goth chick, does all the magic that King Arthur needs, which isn't actually a ton of magic, but what he needs, she does. Um, I think that would irritate Brian. Um, well, I mean, speaking for myself, if I had a hot goth chick wizard around, I would like it if she did everything I wanted. Just saying. Well, the, uh, the dangerous thing. I'm going to say that. No, that's not what I said. I said something completely different. Oh, I didn't I'm say just... she did what Arthur commanded her to do. Oh, because I heard that. What I said I was, just, was I'm just filtered. the magic that needed to happen for Arthur to succeed, she did all of it. There were no other mages on Arthur's side. Whether Arthur wanted her to do the magic or not, she did it. And a lot of times he didn't want her. This brings me to the next point I think Brian would really dislike. It's kind of funny for a man who is planning and carrying out, uh, including up to uh, an attempt of assassination on the king, shooting him from long distances to assassinate him. No, no honor whatsoever, no chivalry, no fighting on the battlefield, straight up murdering him with a sniper. There's an attempt made on the king's life. For a person who's planning all this mayhem and, and killing, Arthur plays, nevertheless, the reluctant hero almost the entire movie. Uh, he's very conflicted and goes back and forth again, which takes us back to Hamlet. But the fallacy that the movie falls into is that the only reason Arthur decides to take down this brutal despot who is enslaving children and makes a deal with the Vikings for Danegeld to be paid in the form of not gold, but 10,000 children as a down payment and 5,000 every year thereafter to be sent away to live with the Vikings and raised as their own, this Danegeld, Vortigern, agrees to in return for the Vikings not attacking the kingdom, not attacking England. This evil, evil man who has done horrible things to Arthur himself, he doesn't get involved. He doesn't finally commit, even though he's doing all this guerrilla warfare, until there's some personal thing, until it's all dang it personal. The king has done something directly to him, and now he has to go down. Yeah, that's clown shoes right there. So, and Castutus uh, uh, Calvatus in the uh, chat is pointing out that that is, in point of fact, Joseph W. Campbell's, um, you know, hero's journey. Only instead of them uh, resisting the call of an adventure at the very beginning and then going out and doing stuff, he kind of tries to resist the call of adventure up until the last fifth of the movie. It's really weird that way. That's that's how it is everywhere. You, once you see it, you can't unsee it as this refusing the call. Like Again, if any Hollywood screenwriters are, are listening to us, 
you don't have to check off all the boxes of the hero's journey. And you don't, you don't have, have to keep to check off any of them. Yeah, and you don't have to keep repeating. You don't have to put refusing the call and repeat. That's what that's what everything is. All this conflicted, reluctant hero takes him forever to finally take up the mantle. Just have a guy go do something. Why can't we just have a guy go do something? Um, and at one point, Arthur. Now this is a very small point. It's very one line, but I know it's something that would get right under Brian's skin. He actually says to King Vortiger, and accurately, man. King Vortigern asks him at one point in the movie while he's interrogating Arthur, where did your drive come from? Why are you so obsessed? What drove you to become this criminal kingpin to dominate your section of Camelot so thoroughly that everyone passing through had to play by your rules or, or they got run out? And it doesn't get answered till the very end of the movie. When it does get answered is this. Arthur says, well, what gave me that drive was that I grew up in this brothel and I was deprived all my life and I had to fight to live and survive and everything. In fact... You, he says to King Vortigern, you made me. Oh. Um, now, the line is supported by the material that we've seen prior to the movie, but it's still not a great line to come out. And I know that would get right up Brian's nose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't throw up a little bit, but I did gag. <laughs> Um, Read a different book, guys. Yeah. It's not you, Hollywood screenwriters. Yeah. Um, screenwriter. There's a couple of other nitpicks I have, including one just tremendously, just absolutely painful moment that for me didn't ruin the rest of the movie because it happens really, really late. Um, I don't even want to talk about it because it's a real big spoiler, and but it, it was painful to watch, and I was just like, oh, that was stupid. There are about three of those moments in the movie, three just immensely stupid moments. For example, they talk about the mages as if they were some kind of ethnic subgroup. And about people, you know, running the mages out, and the mages have lived among us and stuff. Like, you know, like they're... <laughs> they proper nouned it. Yeah. I just, they, they did the same thing. Uh, it's funny. I thought of this because you mentioned Pirates of the Caribbean earlier. They kind of did that with pirates in those movies, too. It's a little strange, the way they use that language. Yeah. So, once again, I did enjoy the movie. There's a lot of great visuals in the movie. There's a lot of great characters in the movie. And one of the moments that I thought reminded me most of The Witcher 3 is there are these three half-human, half-sea creature um immensely evil women two of whom are are very lithe and sexy and one of whom is vast and bloated um and they're grotesque and they're disgusting and the interactions between vortigern and them are fascinating for what they say about vortigern's character and they just they're not something that was in the witcher 3 or indeed in anything else i've ever seen but they did recall to mind several of, uh, of one, at least one of the encounters that comes up in The Witcher 3. So I did enjoy the movie. On a personal level, I enjoyed it. However, I'm betting audiences aren't going to go see it in vast numbers. And also betting that my personal enjoyment of the movie is not going to translate to most people listening to the show. I'm betting that most people listening to the show aren't going to like it. Now, let me. I focused on, I guess, have I focused primarily on bad stuff? Is that what I've been talking about mainly? Only in the second half of the show. Okay. It is a fun movie. It moves very, very quickly. Once you accept the world that it's happening in, that's perfectly reasonable to have several um, black characters in 500 you know, the equivalent of 500 AD. Once you accept that there's a guy named Kung Fu George who teaches Arthur how to kick ass in a gladi gladiator-style school, once you accept the, you know, bizarreness and strangeness going on, there's a lot of good stuff that's happened that's very, very interesting, and it's not stolen from other movies. Uh, or at least the elements that have appeared in books and movies before are taken in and transformed and made the director's own. It's a fun action movie. The characters, for the most part, are likable. And I did enjoy it. But my bet is most normal people, most average people, aren't going to enjoy it and aren't going to see it 
uh, in vast numbers, then I would guess that it's going to be very polarizing when it comes to the geek community that a lot of geeks are going to find uh, plenty of nits to pick with the movie because they are absolutely there and some of them are big and just can't get past the fact they call it a King Arthur movie when it's not actually King Arthur. Uh, it has really nothing to do with uh, the King Arthur legend. So... That's my complex discussion of the movie. I enjoyed it, but I am wise enough to realize that, that will not translate to most people. As many in the chat are thanking you for uh, sparing them eight dollars. It's uh, by the way, it's not a badly done movie either. It the special effects are impeccable. The camera work is amazing. Guy Ritchie is a brilliant director. He knows how to put interesting images on the screen, and he does that very, very well in this movie. Um, so, I don't know, for people who are, if you like fantasy and you wanna see some different fantasy, it's worth going and seeing just on that basis. If you're a fantasy fan and you wanna see something that is not a Lord of the Rings clone, it's worth going and seeing just on that basis. Fair enough. Uh, not necessarily paying full money to go see it at the theaters, mind you. If you want to catch it on Netflix or Redbox or whatever, by all means, you know, feel free. But, yeah, it's worth seeing just uh, some of the monsters, some of the characters, some of the, you know, some of the little touches of, of magic and things like that are, are interesting, at least. So, we are well out of time. We went... Uh, I thought we, that would take up like the first half of the show and then we'd talk about something else for the last 15 minutes. But well, uh, That's great. We had a detailed and nuanced review of a Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie, so just let that sink in. <laughs> um, before we take off, uh, Brian, do you have any last words? I do. Again, for those who joined late, make sure to catch me and special guest Yakov Merkin on Geek Ab on the Books this Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Also, uh, I will draw you guys' attention to the links below the show notes. Uh, we've got links to all the various host blogs and stuff, and also to my Amazon page where you'll find my award-winning SoulCycle series. Um, if you, even if you've already picked those up, um, I encourage you to go on Amazon, leave a review. I cannot overstate how important it is to authors to get honest reviews. So that's your homework. Um, do you have anything to say before we kick off, John? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. Thank you guys for another enjoyable Geek Gap. If you guys want to talk about gaming, the next gaming podcast is tentatively scheduled for May 25th. See you later. Um, all right, folks, thanks for tuning in. By the way, uh, you can catch Geek Gab on the Google Play Store, you can catch us on the SoundCloud, and you can catch us on the iTunes Store. Just do a search for Geek Gab, and you can uh, subscribe to the podcast in any of those three locations, download the show, listen to them on your computer, or listen to them on your mo favorite mobile device. Uh, by the way, just so you are, uh, just so you know, all three podcasts in this channel, in the Geek Gab channel, all three of our podcasts, which is on the books with Brian Nehemiah, Geek Gab Game Night with uh, John and Geek Gab Prime here. All three of those are available through our podcast feed, so you uh, aren't going to miss anything. You don't have to subscribe multiple times. And we are also available on YouTube at youtube.com slash geekgab. That is youtube.com slash geekgab. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Um, we really appreciate everyone who jumped into the chat to talk about things with us, your hosts. And uh, hopefully if you super double secret subscribe, that is click the little bell icon under, under subscribe. After you click subscribe, then click the little bell icon. You too can be uh, made aware of when the show is going live and you can come and uh, come to the show and participate in the chat. And let me give you a quick example why. Today, I scheduled this show about five hours ago. So anybody who had email would receive a notification five hours ago that the show was going live, but for various reasons, we were only able to put out the announcement on social media about 20 minutes before the show uh, went on the air. And so people who may have been interested couldn't 
come and listen. So if you super double secret subscribe the way YouTube is making you now, you could have got the announcement in plenty of time because sometimes we schedule them days in advance. You could have, could have got the announcement in plenty of time to make it to the show and participate in the chat. Everybody in the chat always has uh, has a good time. So just a suggestion. It, it doesn't actually do anything for us of the channel. It doesn't make our subscribe you know, list look better. It doesn't look like we have more subscribers. It doesn't actually help us at all. It's just a tip for you, our listeners who want to get the uh, who want to get the announcement of when the show is going live. All right. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thanks for uh, supporting the show. We are leaving. We are signing off for today. But don't worry. We will be back.